How did you get to that point to be able to be raw and open and vulnerable to start speaking that? When I learned that people weren't going to judge me for it, but embrace me for it. When I learned that it wasn't going to ruin my career talking about things that needed to be talked about. Because like in country music, from an early age, we're taught that successful country music comes from cold beer, pretty girl, dirt road, pickup trucks. Green tractors. Green tractors. <laughs> it's like redneck Mad Lib. It's like, it's like really easy. Like how can we dumb this down to the common denominator to where 17-year-old high school girls and 40-year-old blue-collar hardworking men are still going to love the song. That's what country music, top 40 country music has been distilled into is how can we reach every demographic with one song? And it's easy. Talk about the cool things about being rural. Talk about Friday nights, dirt road, drinking with friends, good times. But nobody wants to talk about the fucked up things that you can't talk about at the Thanksgiving table. That's where I come in. That's where all of my favorite writers come in. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers from all walks of life. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I've realized there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved, or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you truly love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. This episode is brought to you by Kimes Ranch and Carrie Kelly Bits and Spurs. So it's interesting. You guys just came up from your, I think, in New Braunfels and then in Austin. Now you're here in Fort Worth. And for the longest time, dude, I thought you were just from Texas. Like until I, until you and I started chatting about, you know, having you on the show, I was like, oh, sweet. Well, that'll be easy. Be yeah. For him. Yeah. He's Texas guy. Just because of the music you play and in that genre of Tex, quote, Texas country. Yeah. I just assume you're here from here, but no, you're from North Carolina. Yeah, I, I promise you're not the only person. There's a lot of people that still, to this day, 16 years into my career, born and raised in North Carolina, still live in North Carolina. They come up to me and they're like, man, like, so good to have like Texans playing this kind of music. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm not from Texas. They're like, well, you live in Austin, right? And I was like, I, I do not. <laughs> I was like, I just make the, make the journey here quite a bit. It's funny, the way we got started in Texas was all of the, because we tried to come to Texas a few times. And nobody cared. You know, Texas, for better or for worse, is extremely nationalistic. They're very, (laughs) if you ain't from Texas, we don't care. Yeah. And the first couple times we came through, we played, you know, some clubs and some dance halls. And we literally had one guy come up to us in Denton, Texas. He's like, man, I love y'all's music. And I was like, man, we have shirts and cities. He's like, oh, I don't buy stuff unless they're from Texas. (laughs) And I was like, well, that's, oh, that's, a, that's a hard line <laughs> right there. But we got lucky because a lot of the Texas bands, we were like their favorite band. So they started bringing us to Texas and letting us open for them. So the first band that brought us to Texas was Jason Boland and the Stragglers. Yep. What uh, year would that have been? That would have been 2010. Okay. Jason had a pedal steel player named Roger Ray. And Roger Ray was at a bar one night. We were playing in Louisville, Texas. And there was nobody in the bar. I'm talking about we were playing literally for the sound guy. Yeah. And Roger Ray was at the bar, and he watched our whole set. And he walked up to us after. He's like, man, you guys are from North Carolina? I was like, yeah. He's like, you guys would do really well here if people just heard, heard your music. Yeah. And he was like, I'm in a band called Jason Bowen and the Stragglers. And I had no idea. Like, I'm from North Carolina. I, I had zero idea who these red dogs. He named off. He's like, you know, like Randy Rogers, Wade Bowen, like Cody Canada. I was like, I don't know who any of these people are. And he's like, well, we got a booking agent. I'll give the booking agent your CD. And, you know, you hear that all the time in the music business. It's like, but like two days later, the agent calls me. He's like, Roger Ray couldn't stop talking about your band. I'd love to come see you. So, like, the the agent flew out and saw us. And about a week later, we were with, we had a booking agent that focused on Red Dirt, Texas music. And so then Bolin took us out for a tour. But Bolin kept telling us about this band that had been opening for them all year called the Turnpike Troubadours. And this is, this is before Diamonds and Gasoline came out. And so in 2012, Diamonds and Gasoline comes out, and we release a record called Burn, Flicker, Die. Produced it with Jason Isbell down in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. 
and we team up with Turnpike. This is Turnpike still in a van and trailer. <laughs> like we're all just we're sleeping on like like it's early for both bands and just hard living, hard play. Like shows were legendary because we were playing like tiny rooms. It was like people don't believe me when I tell them that like we were playing like like hundred cap rooms, two hundred cap rooms. And so for the next probably two or three years, we were just touring with Turnpike and watching their rise. It was like I'd never seen anything like it at that point. Right. And they and we were touring with them. We watched them go from a van and trailer to a bus and trailer to two buses and trailers to two buses and a tra- like a tractor trailer. And they were just kind enough to keep us on. And like literally for it was about two two and a half years. Every show we played was just opening for the Troubadours. Yeah. And as their fan base grew, they started associating us with them. And so I think that's where a lot of the Texas stuff came from. Because with when you're opening for the Troubadours, you get invited to all the festivals. So we started doing Steamboat. We started doing Larry yeah. Joe Taylor. We started doing. All of these very Texas centric festivals, and you know, I always joke with people that we're kind of like the the weird cousins that still <laughs> that still get invited to the family reunion. Like nobody really knows why we're there, but they're like, "Yeah, you kind of fit in. You got the same last name. Like y'all kind of belong here." And so uh, well, we've been very lucky because for the last decade, Texas has kind of become our second home. Yeah, it's weird to be bigger in Texas than you are in your hometown. Like when I play in New Braunfels or Fort Worth or Austin, like I'm playing thousand to two thousand cap rooms. Yeah. In North Carolina, that's not the case. North Carolina, we're playing like the thousand cap room. Yeah. So it's kind of bizarre for a band in North Carolina to be big in Texas, and they just accept us. They're just yeah. like because now the I, I think most people the secret's out. It's like yeah, we get it. They're not from Texas, but they, we still love their music. You know. Right. And I think that's the thing that I love about Texas in general is just. They appreciate the honesty. They appreciate the work. And if you're willing to be honest and open and true to who you are, and as long as you're willing to work your ass off, I think there's a respect that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Do they wish we were from Texas? Probably. <laughs> but like, do they accept us? They're like, yeah. They're Because like, I think a lot of the, the ideals that a lot of people hold really strongly here in Texas, like that authenticity is yeah. a huge thing. Being real, for better or for worse, whether or not you like how real I am or not, I think a lot of folks respect that kind of transparency. 100%. Yeah. Like it, it's something I've learned, you know, over the years is being honest to who you are. And it was hard for a long time. I was in sales. And so you're taught to be a chameleon, you know, adapt to yeah. whatever situation you're in. And of course, as a human that like, if we, if we look at the, like the evolution, like that's how you survived, right? Like you had to be part of a tribe. But what I've learned is like, I'll, be honest with who you are and those that fit with that will align with that and respect it so much more. And those that don't, that's fine too. And you know, they're going to go their way and I'll go my way. And so I hear that a lot with your music and I'll read a quote that you said, you said, as long as you stay true to your roots and write honest songs, people are going to listen. doesn't have to be manufactured bullshit. Yeah. There's so many people that come to Texas that think they have to play to Texas. They think they have to play that, they have to play to the crowd. And and I think that's the reason that we made it in Texas. It's because we didn't. We were just true to who we, we were, just a bunch of North Carolina rednecks that played music. And we always owned it. Every show starts off with, we're American Aquarium from Raleigh, North Carolina. Thanks for being here. And I think that's the only reason, because I've got plenty of friends that tried the same thing. They opened for the big Texas bands. They kept coming out here for years, and they just couldn't fire and never caught. And I think that the reason was they were trying too hard to play to Texas. And, you know, I think there, there's something to be said. Like, we never up and moved to Austin. We didn't come here and try to make – like, we were just like, this is a place we're going to focus on, but, you know, we're not moving there. We're not Texan. Like, we're not going to try to be Texan. And I think that ultimately us being true to who we were, just a bunch of North Carolina rednecks, <laughs> led to us finding success in Texas. Yeah, it's funny when we think of authenticity because, like, it took me a very long time to be comfortable with who I was as a person because, like, again – when you're a small town kid, moved to a big city. For me, I went to college. I moved from my, if I'd have stayed home, I'd have been a seventh generation tobacco farmer. And so I moved to Raleigh, which was a big city. And I went to college there. And it was a big jump. And I feel like I had to be somebody else. I, I couldn't feel like I could be just like a small town redneck kid. I felt like I had to kind of, like, it's funny, social chameleon is a word that I use a lot too. Like, I had to learn how to fit in different situations. I had mm-hmm. to learn how to hang out with rednecks. I had to learn how to hang out with city kids, musicians. You know, there's a, a bunch of different, like, cliques, even in adulthood. It's like oh, a yeah. big high school. 
and you got to learn how to <laughs> play well with everybody. But it wasn't until probably my thirties, and if I'm being completely honest, it, it wasn't until sobriety that I started being honest with myself, like looking in the mirror and still seeing all the flaws, but accepting all the flaws and learning that those flaws are are what make are, are part of yeah. my makeup. Like everybody wants to focus on the good qualities you have. Like your bad qualities are just as important to who you are as a person as your good qualities are. And so when you when you when you're able to take that look in the mirror and not turn to booze, not turn to drugs, and you have to actually accept those bad things. That's how you can make that progress. That's how you can work to make those bad things good things. And ultimately becoming happy with who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. And that that avoided me for all of my twenties. All of my twenties, I was trying to be a version of myself that I thought everybody else wanted me to be. I thought I had to live up to this like rock and roll like lifestyle. And I thought rock I thought rock and rollers was just drugs and booze and girls. And I, th- I thought that's what it was. And then in my thirties, I quickly realized that like, you don't have, you can still be a rock and roller. Like anybody that comes to our show, nobody's leaving me like, well, that dude's not a rock and roller. <laughs> you know, I learned that I could still do my job and still be true to who I want to be. Like follow the career path I want to follow, uh-huh. but I don't have to do it by anybody else's. Like I get to write the, the blueprint. Right. And that's when, well, once you realize that, once you realize that you're in charge of your own destiny, that's when you're unstoppable. When you yeah. realize that you don't have to conform to anybody else, that you can just do what you do, and there will always be an odd audience for like honest, authentic, transparent songwriting. That was the biggest thing for me. I was like, wait a minute, like I can just, and that's why like to like kids who start writing songs want to write about themselves all the time because they feel like they're interesting. They feel like you know, I'm gonna tell my stories and my crazy nights out on the town. But as you get older, you realize you can start telling these much bigger stories, like societal observations, and and, and you're going to gain a bigger audience from it. And I learned that I could start – because at first I was like, I'm, I can only talk about drinking, touring, broken relationships. That's what everybody wants to hear. And, you know, in the past 10 years, I've started talking about death and suicide and losing friends and losing parents and addiction and marriage problems and divorce and miscarriages and – some pretty big topics that like 20 year old me would have been afraid to touch because I, I wasn't confident enough in myself to write about that kind of stuff. But here I am pushing 40 and I feel very confident that I can, there's not an issue I'm not afraid to tackle anymore. And it all came from learning to love myself and learning to be confident in myself. Yeah. It's so interesting. My mind's going all kind of different ways. How do I navigate? Like, I'm trying to figure out which question I want to go with. We can take all the roads. We can go down one, back because up, and then go down the next it's one. It's very similar, man. It's like nature versus nurture. You know, we're not born with any of these ideas that we have today. Those came, I think, through our surroundings, our environment, who we were, you know, raised around and who our friends were in, in college and the stories that we create in our own head. We create our own reality, right? Yeah. Based off of those stories. So good, bad, or indifferent, like I can direct my reality in the sense like, well, I'm not this, I'm this. You know, I start to identify with certain things and based off of those stories, right? Yeah. It's like, I was the same way in my 20s. What is success? I only knew of it was money. Like that was for me. Like money equals success, money equals happy, money equals all these things. Come to find out, money is a byproduct of doing what you love to do and doing that thing very well. Because the thing is, you get to, you get a certain amount and then it's more. I need more to fulfill yeah. that, you know, that itch. Okay, I get more. And then I'm still left like, well, fuck, why do I feel this way? Yeah. You know? And so then same deal, like in my thirties, it was like this, I don't know if we ever hit rock bottom, but I was in a dark place. And then you start, I started doing the soul searching, you know, like really trying to figure out, okay, what the fuck is it that makes me happy? How do you become happy? Like what, what can I get to make me happy? Well, the answer is nothing because it comes from within. Yeah. There's that awakening. I, I, I truly hope everybody goes through it. Right. I like to think that everybody has to go through that at one point in their life where they wake up one day and they realize that, don't get me wrong, money, we need money to live. We need money to pursue endeavors that make us happy. Yep. But when money is the only thing keeping you somewhere, that's not happiness. Oh, yeah. When it's money, like they, they call it the golden handcuffs. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and, and, and money's funny because, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're like, man, all I want is enough money to do this, this, and this. <laughs> yes. 
And then you get there, and you realize that hole gets even deeper. And yeah. no matter how much money you throw in that hole, it never gets full. Never gets full. And so as a kid, you're like, all I really need is this, this, and this. And you get all that stuff, and you're like, well, now that I got that, well, all I need is this, this, and this. Yeah. And it never ends. You know, I've got – because I, I went through it. We, me and my friends in college, we all started at the same place. We're all in college. We're all pursuing a better life for ourselves. I chose a very divergent path. I got, I got all – they were going A to B pretty straightforward. It's like I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a job, entry level. I'm going to work my way up through it. And then by hopefully by the time I'm in my mid-30s, I'm either mid-level management or I'm running the place. And I decided to go back roads. And I'm like, I don't know where the hell I'm going. I'm just going to take this thing because it looks fun. And so it's funny because about for 10 years, I'm over here in just brush, <laughs> having zero idea. Like navigation doesn't work. I have no idea where I am. And they're still just treading along. And I'm watching it from afar. You're watching them buy the house. You're watching them have the kids, you're watching them get married. You're watching them buy the vacation home. You're watching them life. And I'm still over here in a damn dune buggy, just just bumping <laughs> bumping around, having zero idea what I'm doing. But it's funny because like I was doing something I loved, and they were doing something they don't love. But they were only doing it for the the ends. Mm-hmm. They weren't doing it for themselves. They were doing it for what it, it gave them. There was this really funny moment in my mid 30s where my path started getting easier, and then I met back up with them at point B, the house, the kids, the success, financial security vacation home and it's funny because when you meet back up at that point b you get to talking about man the journey to point b was kind of crazy right but i love it because i'm doing what i love i built this thing i'm the owner of a small business and like it was really hard but like now it's like fruitful it's the best feeling in the world to build something from nothing and then to sit back and look at it yeah and then they're like i hate my job (laughs) i never get to see my kids me and my wife have grown Further apart, every single year we've been married, the only thing we have to show for it is the material thing. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, we have the same material stuff. But like, I am, I've never been more in love with my wife. Like, I love, like, when I'm home, I'm home 300 days a year now. And when I'm home, my wife doesn't work. So, like, it's 24-7, like, hanging with the kid. That's it's awesome. not like I get to see my kid an hour before I go to work, hour when I get home, eating dinner. It's like, from the time she wakes, like, she's, I, she wakes me up every morning. Yeah, we let mom sleep a little bit, and <laughs> we go downstairs and make pancakes and watch cartoons because, like, I'm just a kid. I yeah. never had to grow up. I, I'm I'm the Peter Pan syndrome. Like, <laughs> I never had to grow up, and so it's it, it's so weird talking to my friends because you see, and not all of my friends are like that. If any of my friends are listening to this, it's not about you, man. It's not about <laughs> you. You're 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 great. You're happy. I'm not talking about our conversations, <laughs> but there's there's people that like you get to that point where. You look back 5, 10, 15, 20 years after you leave college and you ask yourself, was that road worth it to get here? Do I truly love what I did to get here? And there's a lot of folks these days that can't say that. Yeah. And I feel so fortunate because I didn't know. Like, when well, we, What was it that pushed you? Like, Yeah, to go down there's that no, road. There, there's no failing. You, failing was not an option for me. Okay. So there like, was no backup plan. Zero. Like I like I I was going to school for political science and history. I dropped out of school. I was going to be a lawyer. Ever since I was a kid, most kids want to be astronauts or cops or firefighters. I was like 8 wanting to be a lawyer for Halloween. I want to dress up in a suit. <laughs> I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> All through high school, when it's summertime, kids are going to camps, they're going to sport camps. I was literally going to Duke University every summer going through their like like mock trial camps. And we were literally just reading case law. And like, this is like seventh, eighth grade. I shouldn't have, I should have been having fun in the summer. Yeah. And I was going literally spending entire summers at Duke University in, in their town identification program, doing like court cases, like mock trials all summer working. Like it's, it's, it's what I loved. Yeah. So I, high school came and I did really well academically in high school, got a full ride to NC state and I go to state and I just music finds me. And all of a sudden, it's like lawyer, being a lawyer wasn't important anymore. I wanted to spend every waking moment writing songs. And once you jump off the edge of that cliff with no parachute, you either figure out how you're going to fly or you're hitting something. Had you been playing the guitar? No, not at all. I started playing guitar in college. Really? Like, it, I, how, did that, how did it find you? So I grew up in a really small town. We didn't have live music venues. It's not like Texas where every town has a dance hall and a bar where there's live music every weekend. 
Like in North Carolina on Friday and Saturdays, the question is, are you going to a show? And in Texas, mon- Sunday through Sunday, it's what show are you going to? Mm. There's no like, are you going to a show? It's just which one are you going to this right. weekend? Are you going to see this one? Or are you going to drive two hour and see something else? Yeah. And so like growing up, like we didn't have music venues. And I thought that being a musician, there's two musicians in the world. There was Tim McGraw level of playing the Enormo Dome, playing the top 40 hits. And then there was like your uncle that knew how to play guitar around a campfire. (laughs) I had zero idea. There was this like middle ground of like independent music. So moving to a big city, moving to a college town, you start realizing like, oh, wait, like there's bands that tour and only play in front of about 100 people every night and make a living doing it. I was like. It was like a light bulb went off. I was like, mm-hmm. and after you see a certain amount of like bad bands, you're like, I could do that. I could probably do that better. Yeah. I think I could write better songs than that. And so then you try and, and then you play them for your friends. Like, That's pretty good. I'm like, I think I'm going to try to do this. And then as I think the turning point is when people started coming to our shows that weren't my friends. People I didn't know were coming to our shows and singing along. And they knew the words, yeah. And I was like, oh, like, I might be okay at th- I might be pretty good at this. Yeah. So then you start taking it from your town and you start doing these tiny little circles and playing a couple towns around you, staying in your state, playing some other big cities in your state. Then you start moving one state away. And these little centripetal circles turn into, you look up three or four years later, you're a regional band. Mm-hmm. Then you fast forward a couple of years, keep doing those same circles. And then all of a sudden you're like an East Coast band. And then once you, uh, then you look up and you're like, holy shit, I've been to every state and I've yeah. played songs everywhere. But once you jump off that cliff with no parachute, it, it, for me, there's no quit in me. I don't know how to say I, – I, I, I've never quit anything in my entire life other than <laughs> drinking, which I think is a good thing to quit <laughs> if you were me. Some of y'all out there are social drinkers, and you're, you're fine, and I'm extremely jealous of you that you can have one or two drinks a night and still be functioning members of society not burn down your entire life. <laughs> I'm jealous of you out there. But for me, that was the one thing I've quit that was good. But everything else – it, it just doesn't live in me. And I think that's what me and my father bonded over later in life because my dad does not get what I do. My, dad does, my dad's not a feelings guy. My dad's very typical Southern male. Like, you keep your feelings inside. You don't talk about it to anybody. You let that stuff bubble up, yeah. and you learn how to control that stuff because men don't feel things, and men don't talk about things. They shoulder things, and you're the – you know, you don't talk about them. So it blows my mind because my dad will come to a show and be like, man – I just don't get it, man. Like, people pay money to like listen to you, like talk about your feelings. <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, yeah, I guess when you simplify it down to like the base, I, I guess that's technically what I do. He's like, man, I just it, it blows my mind. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely blows my mind. Because my dad was the kind of guy that worked like 50, 60 hours a week, hard manual labor, like yeah. to take care of his family. Work wasn't fun. Work was a way to put a roof on your head, a way to put food in your belly. Work wasn't supposed to be enjoyable. So he comes, sees me prancing around stage, singing to people, having a great time. He's like, that ain't work. He's like, how do you get paid for that? And so I think my dad, but my dad taught me from a very early age, especially farming, that it's important to work hard for stuff. And when you have a vision for something, whether it's not making, having a summer job, making enough money to buy you a car or building a career, you don't quit at it. It's going to get hard. It's going to be very hard. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you get to walk away from it. Right. Like I played sports growing up. My dad never let me quit any of the sports. Like sports, I was god awful at. Sports, I had to play entire seasons of and just continuously learn to lose. <laughs> there was no quitting. There was no option to quit. And so I, I think my dad really loves that. Like I applied that in a very non traditional way. He taught me an extremely important thing, which is outwork every single person around you, and you'll be successful. Yeah. And the harder you work. And the harder the work you like you get, you know? <laughs> but I think watching me apply that in a very non-traditional way made him proud 20 years later. Because mm-hmm. he looks at it and he's like, I don't get what you do, but something that I instilled in you got you to where you are. Right. And I can be proud of that That's cool. as a father. Cool. And so, like, when people ask, like, well, you know, during the 10 years of sleeping on floors and not making any money and defaulting on credit cards and literally – digging yourself into financial ruin, like, why didn't you just walk away from it? I was like, there was no option to walk away. Like, I was so far into being a musician. Like, if I walked away, I would have to admit to every single person I know, every single person I loved, that I failed at something. And I don't know if anybody out there has ever met me. Like, 
I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to say, like, I failed at this. I'm just going to continue to come. I'll, I will get knocked down 100 times, but that 101st time, I'm going to ride the damn thing. And that's kind of the story of my entire career is I ain't pretty enough to be a country singer. I ain't got the jawline to be a top 40 country <laughs> singer. I do not have the best voice in the world. I am not the best musician in the world. I'm not the best songwriter in the world. But the one thing I get to control every single day is outworking a motherfucker. <laughs> And I look to the left and I look to the right and I'm like, I worked hard on those guys today. I did my job. Yeah. So there's a lot of things intangibles that I can't control. God given gifts that I cannot control. The one thing I control is waking up every single morning earlier than the next guy, going to bed later than the next guy, and knowing that I outworked him every single day. And 16 years in, I still have not met somebody that outworks me in a day. You know, I'm happy to take a challenger. I would love to see it, but you know, I run my business. Yeah. I run the merch store. For the longest time, I did all the booking. I did all the managing. I did all the tour managing. You know, I play seven nights a week when I'm on the road. We've been on the road for 16 days. We had one day off, and I booked a private private show. Hmm. I ain't afraid of the work. And we're at a point now where, like, I don't have to do that. There's just something in my brain. Like, I feel like if I take my foot off the gas, I'm going to lose the car. Yeah, it's like a blessing and a curse, right? The ambition to do those things. And my manager tells me, she's like, you don't have to work this hard anymore. Like, you've built something that you can literally kind of just put on autopilot for a second and sit back. And there is a part of me, no matter how hard I try, and my wife hates it. <laughs> but like on like a Sunday after we put my daughter to bed, my wife's like, you know, doing some cleaning or something. She'll be like, where's BJ? And I'll be in the office packing up orders. She's like, this can't wait till tomorrow. The post office is not open on Sunday night at 7 p.m. There is nothing you can doing tonight that you can't do tomorrow. And there's, I, I can't cut it off. <laughs> And it's, again, it's a blessing and a curse It's because it's led me to where we are now, which is in a very comfortable place. You know, I always joke with people like, I've gotten to a spot in my career musically that 99% of people that ever pick up a guitar never get to. I get to ride around the country in a tour bus. I get to play shows for a lot of people every night. I get to make records. I own my own record label. I own every song I've ever recorded. Like, I'm the luckiest dude in the world. And most people's parents have never heard of me <laughs> and I love it. I, you know what I mean? It's like, I, it's like, like I'm, I'm very grateful for what I have, but again, it's like, I don't see myself slowing down anytime soon because I don't know how to slow down. <laughs> like, I like slowing down. is like, it's not an option. I want to get into your writing process, but before to kind of segue out of what you're saying. So over the last 16 years played and correct any of these stats if they're wrong. Killer. Right? Played over 3,000 shows, 26 different band members of American Aquarium. You played in 13 different countries, 46 different states, and recorded nine albums. Does all that sound about right? Those numbers have changed a little bit. Nine studio records. We have 16 releases in 16 years. So I have 16 albums in 16 years, two live records, an EP, a solo record, two cover records. So 16 records in 16 years. All the states and countries are right. And now I've had 31 band members leave. So... I have five in the band currently, so I've had 36 band members total, 31 of them left. And so for the first seven years of that, you weren't getting paid anything. No, oh, well, pretty much. Anything right? we were getting paid was going to feed us and going to put gas in the tank. Basically. Right. That's what I mean. You're, you're making a couple hundred dollars every show. And I, I have a few friends that are singer songwriters, and I've seen the grind that they go through. And, and I, I, I just, I'm saying that to let anybody listening know it's not all, you know, lights and fame and. What was it for you, though? There's no secret. The compound effect will take over. If you stick with one thing long enough, the compound effect will kick in, and you will start to see, just like when you met up with those friends at yeah. B. And the benefit is you're doing the thing you love to do. But what was it in those times? Like, Because I've listened to some other interviews with you, and you talked about your band members. You all didn't have the same vision. You know, They, they parted ways, but you kept this thing going. What was it? Where was the motivation? I am a, a firm believer that if you are halfway decent at something and you never stop doing it, every day you're going to get better. And you, today I'm better than I was yesterday. Tomorrow I'll be better than I am today at what I do. It might be unnoticeable. It may be microscopic growth, but it's impossible. And you compound that over 15, 20 years. You can't fail. It's, a, it, it's, it's literally impossible. If you keep working as hard as you did today, tomorrow, you're going to be better at it and you're going to be working just as hard. Yeah. The hard part's turning five people into 10 people, into 20 people, into 40 people. It's easy to turn 200 people into 400 people. Easy to turn 400 people into 1,000 people. Right. Those are e that's, that's where we are in our career now. 
every show is growing a lot faster. Every time I come back to town, there's hundreds of more kids there than there were the last time. But when you're first starting off, your goal is like, if there's only five people in the bar, my job was to win all five of those people over. If I can make all five of those people buy a CD, that means next time there'll be 10 people here because they'll bring a friend or they'll bring two friends. And that was the hard stuff. And that's the hard stuff to surround yourself with people that have that same kind of vision and that same kind of level of sacrifice. And I was lucky. And that number gets skewed a bit when we say 31 band members. I'd say probably 20 of those band members came in the first two years of the band. It was like I was in college. I had these dreams of grandeur. And I was like, we're going to be a touring rock and roll band. We're going to play 300 shows a year. Who's with me? And some of those guys were like, man, I'm just I'm going to dental school. Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to tour 300. To, no, yeah. I quit. <laughs> so I, I was really lucky. I was able to put together a band of like-minded individuals. Probably 08, 09. And they stay with me for damn near 10 years. 2017 is the, the first big departure. That 2017 was what we call the old band leaving. That was the old band. Right. The old band was the band I had with me for better or worse, almost a decade. So I had the same five guys for a decade. So like that number gets, you know, yes, there's been 36 members in American Aquarium, but five of those dudes were there for a decade. So that number gets a bit skewed sometimes. I got you. But when they quit in 2017, don't get me wrong. They had the same vision. They were willing to travel the country and sleep on the floors and not make the money. But then it got to a point in 2017 where I think they, they didn't think it could grow anymore. Or I, me, my ego, my, because you got to think by 2017, I'd been sober for three years, but they still had almost seven years of seeing me be drunk and hearing me say, like, I was just a, a verbally abusive drunk. I'd be like, I'd get hammered and be like, you guys are replaceable. You're like, I like, I write the songs. Fuck all you guys. Like, well, like you get drunk and like you get in arguments and then you go take low blows. Everybody takes low blows. And so like even three years of sobriety couldn't offset like how big of a shithead I was for seven years. I was an asshole. I was a terrible person. I was hard to be around. I was hard to start. I, it got to a point where it was hard for them to take up for me, to justify being in a band with a guy like me. I was like, I'm so thankful that everybody in this current version of the band, nobody knew me then. They only know me as kind of the clear-headed, sober, husband, dad, all business, all the time. Like that old band, they had to see like the darkest time of my life. And they still stuck by my side for, for, for way longer than they should. Mm -hmm. If I'm being honest, like those dudes should have hit the door two or three years in, there should be way more turnover in this band than there has been, surprisingly. And that's saying a lot. But I love those guys for that because, like, they literally stuck around. And it wasn't for the money. It wasn't for the fame. It wasn't for the the big shows. It was because they believed in it. Yeah, I truly believe they believed in it. But by 2017, eight to ten years in, that belief starts to to falter sometimes when the shows aren't growing, when you're starting to hit these stalls in your career where, like, the last three times through Fort Worth, we played Magnolia Motor Lounge in front of 200 people, and that's as big as it's ever going to get. Mm -hmm. And so they left. They all decided that they were going to and, – and, and, and it's funny because, like, that, that whole thing got blew out of big proportion because everybody left for completely different reasons. It wasn't just like a fuck you, BJ. We all quit at the same time. <laughs> like, Bill, my bass player, moved to Fort Worth, and he runs a gym. He's like a personal trainer here now, and now he's playing with Kyle Nix from the Troubadours. He's playing bass in the 38s. Wit, my pedal steel player, moved to Nashville. He's playing pedal steel for Thomas Rhett now. So he – pretty big upgrade from American Aquarium. So it's like not everybody quit to like be like, fuck it, I don't want to play music anymore. Like some of those guys just had other aspirations. Wit didn't want to live in Raleigh for the rest of his life. He wanted to move to Nashville, become a studio musician. And in doing so, literally is touring with one of the biggest male vocalists in all of country music. Same way with Bill. Bill moved out to Texas for fitness. He had a complete career change. He ran a gym and he's only been playing music again for like the last year or two. He came out here for the last five years and has been like in the fitness world. And a lot of those guys, don't get me wrong, a couple of those guys quit because they hated me. And they were just like, <laughs> I can't be in a fucking band with this guy anymore. But a lot of those guys quit because they had, they had, they're like, we gave 10 years of ourself to this thing. Yeah. And it's time to go. It's time to move on. It's time to do something that we want to do or something. Or like, cause we were all, like, I always tell people we were planted at the same time. So we we're, when we first started, we were all that trunk of the tree. 
But over time, over a decade, those branches start growing in much different directions. So look at a tree 10 years after you plant it. What started off as a trunk is very, very far apart. Right. And that's exactly where our visions were. Our visions for the band, our visions for our life, our visions of success. Mm-hmm. We were all in different places. So everybody did a hard reset. That was a that was a really hard time for me. Like having a, the whole band walk away from this thing. It's like, well, shit, do I keep, can I keep going? What's the rules on this? Like I've never had a whole band quit. There's no handbook at Barnes & Noble for, you know, what to do when your entire band quits middle of a tour for dummies. You know, like <laughs> that, that doesn't exist. And, and my wife, being the uh, the voice of reason she's always been, said, as long as you you wrote all the songs, I'm the sole songwriter in American Aquarium. She's like, as long as you still feel comfortable playing these songs. She's like, none of those guys were original members of the band. Everybody's been a replacement since you started the band. As long as you feel comfortable playing these songs, she's like, I promise you that people will still show up to hear American Aquarium as long as you're singing the songs. Mm -hmm. And I did not believe her. I thought that everybody associated American Aquarium with the six dudes that played on the records they loved. And the first tour that we went on as the new band, like many times in our marriage, I realized that she was totally right and I was totally wrong. (laughs) Because the first show we played was a sold out show in Lubbock, sold out show in Dallas, sold out show in Green. Totally new band. And people were still there just screaming the words to the songs. Yeah. Did they miss their friend who used to play bass or pedal yeah. steel or drums? Of course they did. But they were, were never coming to the shows for the individuals. They were coming for the shows for the songs and to sing the songs. And don't get me wrong, the people that were just friends with the guys in the band, they don't come to shows anymore. And I get that. Like, why would you come see the guy that ran, ran your favorite people off? But our fan base, like, there was never even like a stall. There was never even like, okay, we need one tour to win everybody back over. It was... We, we just picked back up from the last tour that we went on. Sage advice. She's a smart girl. Yeah, man, she's, I wish I could say that was the only time that she's been totally <laughs> right and, and completely saved me from myself, but it's not. My wife is a, I don't think it's a coincidence that as soon as I got married, my career took over, my personal life got better. Like I became a better human being, just stopped being a shithead. Cause for the longest time I was a pretty bad person, but she saw something in me. Like she saw me at my worst. She has seen me. I've put that woman through stuff that no other human being should ever have to see. And she still wakes up every morning believing in the good parts of me. And that's the most, I hope everybody gets to feel that sometime. I hope everybody has somebody in their corner that always sees the good, even when the bad is up front, even when the bad is the only thing blurring their vision, they can still look through it and say, I know what's inside of there. I've seen the best parts. How long have y'all been married now? We have been married eight years next week. Eight oh, years on the, th- we got married on uh, December 12, 13, 14, 12, December 13th of 14. Just so I don't, I, I can never forget <laughs> our anniversary. The last sequential date of the century. Yeah. So I guess, what is that? Tuesday? I get home Monday. I know not to book shows on anniversaries. So <laughs> I get home Monday. My anniversary is Tuesday. Smart man. I learn quick, but yeah, I truly hope everybody can find somebody in their life that, that does that because she's been the driving force behind every good thing that's happened to me for the last decade. That's awesome. We've been dating for 11 years now, married almost eight. And those first three years would have ran anybody off. She hunkered down and said, I'm not leaving because it's hard. I'm staying because I see something. I know what you can be. And now she get, now she's getting to reap those rewards of seeing the husband that I've become, seeing the dad I am. And I always told her, I was like, I have fucked every relationship I've ever had up, ever, including me and her relationship. My daughter is the only relationship I haven't fucked up. And I told her, I was like, I promise I'll never fuck that one up, ever. And so she gets to see that. She gets to see me be the dad. They're like, she knew I would always be. And like, my daughter thinks I'm a fucking superhero. <laughs> my daughter thinks I'm the coolest. I'm like, my daughter knows what I do for a living. She comes to the show. She sees the crowds. She thinks it's the cool. She's like, we, I, I was on the phone with her yesterday. And she was like, today we talked about what our parents did for a living. And they asked, she's like, I'm like, what'd you tell them I do for a living? She's like, I told them that you travel the world and make people happy. <laughs> That's a cool answer. I was like, that, that is what I do, kid. And then they're like, I had to describe what you do. I told him you play the guitar and you sing songs that you wrote. And my my teacher told me that 
that you're a musician. She's like, is that what you are? And I was like, yeah. I was like, that's the, I guess the technical term for what I do. She's like, I think that's pretty cool. And I was like, that I don't need any more. Fuck a Rolling Stone review. <laughs> fuck a Pitchfork review. Like, I've got a five-year-old kid who thinks I, I got a pretty cool job. Like, I'm feeling pretty good about it. So the, the tattoo on your knuckle says Amor Fati. Yeah. And so I have to think anybody that has that written on their hand is implementing some type of mindfulness practices. You know, if you're reading Stoic philosophy and if you know what that means, Amor Fati, then... If you're reading multiple Nietzsche essays, we can hang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can talk. When did you get into that? And I want to like let that be a segue into some mindfulness practices because I think musicians especially, it's like you like you, you alluded to it earlier. You expect them to go out and get shit faced. You expect them to, you know, do drugs and O D and, and those things. And how hard was that? I'm asking a bunch of questions right now, but how hard was that to navigate for you when you realized, okay, this is an issue. I need to shift my path and you don't have to drink. You don't have to do the drugs. You don't have to do all the things to be successful. The big part is realizing it's an issue. I think that's the hard part a lot of people have is admitting to themselves because nobody wants to admit they're an addict. That's like, it, that's like admitting you failed at something. Mm -hmm. you're, you're surrounded by people that, that aren't addicts Admitting to yourself is admitting that like, oh, something's wrong with me. Everybody looks at sobriety or addiction as there's something wrong with me. Nothing's wrong with you. The hard part is admitting that you need to do something about it. That's the first step. I always mm -hmm. tell people, there, how do I get sober? I'm like, you have to really want it. Until you can admit that you have a problem and you want change, you're not going to change. You're not going to change for your wife. You're not going to change for your mom. You're not going to change for your brother. You're not going to change for your friends. You might change for a week, two weeks, a yeah. year, five years. But permanent change comes from wanting to be a better person. Wanting to stop hurting the people that you care about. Yeah, it comes from pain, right? Like the pain has to be greater yeah. than whatever you yeah. get out of it. Exactly. And like the first probably, I'd say first year of sobriety was hard because again, it's, it's so many times we look ourselves in the mirror. We don't like what we see, whether it's physical or internal. And we drink, we use to dull that vision that we have of ourselves, The hard part is staring at yourself in the mirror and seeing every imperfection and being like, I'm okay with this. Yeah. I've got work to, I've got work to do, but I'm okay with who you are right now. It's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You're never going to be perfect. Yeah. And loving those imperfections, learning how to embrace those imperfections is yeah. the biggest change in my mindset that ever happened. Instead of trying to cover up the flaws that I know I have as a person, try, instead of trying to cover up the flaws that I can physically see, embracing them and knowing mm. them, talking about them, mm. openly confronting them in songs and in interviews on fucking Twitter. Like, you know, it, it's one of those things like people can't hurt me anymore. People can't be like, well, it's not my problem. You're a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. I'm like, yeah. I was like, cool, man. Like, what else are you going to throw out? Like, you're, you're stating things that I've stated multiple times. Like, that's not going to hurt me anymore. Yeah. It's the gratitude, you know, the more fat tea, not only to be okay with what's happening, but to actually love it. The, the love of fate, the idea that. of the love of fate, falling in love with the fact that you are just living the life that you're supposed to live, falling in love with the fact that you can't change that. What's going to happen is going to happen. I love the idea of that. I love the idea of, Falling in love that you were going through the cycle that you were meant to go through mm -hmm. and the struggles that you were meant to go through and the winning you were meant to go through and the losing you were meant to go through. Like, I think it's a beautiful thing because it teaches you just to appreciate every day. 100%. It teaches you to look up instead. It, it teaches you to look up and be constantly aware of how lucky you are. Yeah, I feel like it's a superpower, truly. Like when I can tap into the gratitude and, and truly be grateful for every single thing that happens. Yeah. You're right. No, nobody can fuck with me. Yeah. And as, and as humans, we're taught to kind of look away from it. Like as humans, like, you know, our daily, you know, we're stuck in these things. Mm -hmm. We're stuck in phones. We're stuck looking at other people's greatest hits on Instagram. It's like yeah. all the good things that are happening around you. And sometimes it's hard to sit back in your day and just mentally kind of take like a, like a, a, a check of what's around you and be like, you know what? Today's pretty, pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Today's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, seeing the highlight reel, right? Like yeah, seeing that, everybody else's highlight once reel. Once you realize that that's all social media is, is the good things. Yeah. Because everybody's posting like, 
here's our fall pictures for Christmas cards. <laughs> and nobody's posting. The reason we're doing this is because daddy got drunk and cheated on mommy. And now she, well, we have to take these pictures <laughs> to prove to everybody everything's okay. Ah, that's not the caption. Yeah. It's always like, it's fall, y'all. Yeah. Leap emoji, <laughs> cornucopia emoji, turkey emoji. Instead of yeah. saying like, yeah, we have a really fucked up family. And yeah. this is the only semblance of normality that we have. <laughs> Happy holidays. Yeah. It's funny, but that's so It's true, totally man. true. And, so I, true. I, and I think I try to, a few times a day, I try, I have these moments of clarity where you're, you're doing something and you're just appreciative of it. So and, and it's easy to find those, like, you know, for example, like the biggest moment of clarity I've had this whole entire year, we got to headline the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, the mother church, like the... I, institution of country music every single person that's ever picked up an acoustic guitar and had something to say has hit that stage describe that was a question i had for you i want to know oh what, nice what did that feel like describe the feeling of the being gratitude like walking out and it wasn't the show the show i've played thousands of shows shows are i could do shows in my sleep i could play a show in front of twenty thousand people i can play a show in front of five people same show every time Nothing bothers me show. The sound check is what fucked me up. Empty rhyming. Just the ghost of everybody that's been there before you. Damn, walking out for chills. walking out for the first time and that spotlight hits you. They're adjusting the lights, trying to get the show ready. And you're standing there and you're like, holy shit. Like, I made it here. Again, I always focus. I'm at a point in my career where I, every time something bad happens, I have to remind myself that I am in the 1% of people that ever picked up a guitar and wrote a song. And a moments like that, the rhyming, like when we made our debut at the Grand Ole Opry, walking into that circle. And they make it dramatic as shit. Like the Opry knows exactly what they're doing and they know exactly how heavy that moment is. So when you get there, if you're, if you're making your debut, you're the first person getting there for sound check. The whole room is dark. There's a spotlight on the circle and that's all there is. And they walk you out and they say, whenever you're ready, you can step into the circle. And it's like, you take a deep breath and it, like, it's eerily quiet. There's nobody there. And there's just a spotlight on a circle that Hank Sr. stood in, Johnny Cash stood in, Kitty Wells stood in, Ernest Tubb stood in, everybody that mattered. And you, and you get to take that deep breath and you literally walk from like the shadows into this, this circle. And then the rest of your day is normal. The lights come up, sound check, hustle and bustle. But the, and in those moments is where it's so easy to find gratitude. In mm -hmm. those moments, it's so easy to like be like, "Fuck, this life is cool. <laughs> life is really great." And I get it. Not everybody has those moments every day. I'm lucky that at least once a day, like I do it every night. Every night I'm playing in front of a thousand kids, and I'm looking out and seeing people singing the words that I made up on my living room couch back to me. It's easy to find gratitude in that. Yeah. It's so easy to find gratitude. And when I'm home, same thing. My kid, it's impossible. I don't understand how anybody can't wake up and look at the kid's face and not feel gratitude. Not see a piece of yourself and be like, shit, I am so lucky to be here. Because I, I shouldn't be here. Like, if I hadn't got sober, I wouldn't be here anymore. I'd be gone. Be gone. I was so far into drugs and booze, like, I'd be gone if I, if I hadn't got sober. So every day either seeing people in the crowd or seeing my kid. Constant reminders. E mm -hmm. Those are the easiest places I can find joy. No matter how shitty a day is, no matter how bad a news I get, put on some Paw Patrol and let me see what that kid, and my day is instantly better. I think it's, for me, it's like it has to be intentional. Otherwise, like by, by default, our human brain wants to go to the negative, wants to focus on the negative. For sure. You know, how many... Times do people bitch about their food at a restaurant versus complimenting the chef? Exactly. You know, I'm curious to know from you, though, what mindfulness practices have you implemented to expand that awareness, to maybe catch those stray thoughts and reel you back in to focus more on the gratitude? I think it's more of a making a conscious effort every single day. Because I still, I still have dark times. I still, I still have moments of, of doubt. I still have moments where I, you know, imposter syndrome, where you're worried if like, all of this is unjust. Like there's so many more talented people out there that deserve a platform. And I'm the one that got it. Like, why, you know, I'm not nearly as talented as these people that always kicks itself in, but it's, it's about learning to, to put your brain onto that good stuff. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's, 
Are you doing any meditations, journaling? I write every day. It's something. And it's it's everything from a sentence to something I read on a billboard to a conversation I heard at a diner. You're constantly writing down things. And I read every day. I'm a big reader. Those are my moments where I putting yourself in 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 those and I run every day as well. Like I have these moments where it's like there's probably two or three hours a day where my brain is doing something else and my brain gets to wander. Whether it's, you know, writing and I get to just write down what I'm thinking. Running is the closest thing to meditation I think I do. Cause, I agree. Because yeah. when I'm running, after you get about a half mile in, after you stop focusing on like, fuck, I'm old, my hip hurts, my, my knee hurts, my ankles hurt. Once you get like a half mile in, a mile in, you're sweating. All your brain, all your body is thinking is left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And eventually it's just like when the wind is down and there's a little bit of wind. It's really loud at first. But then after like a 30 minute drive, you don't notice the wind, the loud noise of the wind. Same thing when you're running. It's just your body goes left, right, left, right, left, right. And your brain, it unlocks this thing to where your brain can just be like, well, what else do we have to think about today? Like <laughs> body's on autopilot now. I think it's got the left, right thing down. Unless somebody like pulls out in front of us on a bike or something, like we're going to be good on this, you know, 10 mile trail. And that's where, you know, that's where song ideas come from. That's where holy shit, I do need to call my dad today and say hey to him. Like, that's where every great idea I have during the day usually comes in a run. It hey. usually comes from those those moments of, of not, like, I have to put so much focus into what I'm doing that it, lets, it allows all the extraneous stuff from my day to disappear for 45 minutes. Yeah. And it's pretty crazy because it's the only activity I can do that pushes everything else out because it's you and whatever songs in your earbuds – Mm-hmm. And it's just an open greenway. I treat it as I run too, and and I treat it as a meditation. I will set an intention before I run, and so then my brain goes there. Just like I love that. It usually takes me like five miles to get my body to calm down. It's like this is uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> please stop doing this. Yeah. you know. And I keep going, and then like you said, if it's like a longer ten mile or longer run, dude. It just doesn't stop. It's pretty crazy. It just unlocks this. And I try to tell people that, and they're like, bullshit. Like, running running sucks. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, yes. It does. Truly, it does suck. The whole time your body's telling you, like, please don't do this to me. Yeah. Like, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. But once you can move past that to where it's not an inconvenience, but more of a routine. Because, like, I'm at the point now where, like, if I don't run, my body questions it. Like if if I feel different, if I spend like one or two days and don't run, my body's like, "Where's that abuse that we've become so accustomed to?" Like just like cold shower. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, are you not going to hurt us today? Like, like like, my body feels weird when I don't run, and and the shows are affected differently. It's something about running; it opens up the capillaries, the blood flow. Mm -hmm. Like I feel energized, and then when I walk on stage, it's almost like I've been warming up. Yeah, you know, even if it was three hours ago that I ran, you know. My lungs are like, bring on. The, we just got done running six miles. This fucking 90 minute show is going to be a piece of cake. You know, it's it's in those moments when I'm running that it's easy to, my brain, my brain doesn't go to the negative. I, like, I'm really lucky my brain doesn't go to a lot of the negative stuff anymore because I have addressed so many of the negative issues in my life in song and I get to talk about them every night. And the more you talk about the fucked up things, the less power they have over you. I so, think it's like the compound effect. The more you talk about it, the more you're expanding your awareness around it, the easier you catch those thoughts and you can catch them for what they are and not judge them, but observe them and be like, okay. And then you push it aside and you redirect your focus. hundred percent. Again, I'm, I'm not preaching to anybody. I want to make that clear to everybody listening, like good days, bad days come for me too. But that is an intention I have. And I try to implement through journaling, through meditating, through running all of those different things. To navigate to the best me. I'm very grateful for who I am today, but I want, I know I'm, I'm better tomorrow. I, yeah. I, there's always a better me. Well, you at least there. got a chance to be a better tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's the fun part is knowing that no matter if I lived up to my expectation of myself or not today, mm-hmm. tomorrow I get another chance at it. <laughs> tomorrow I get another chance to be better. And even if I had the best day and, I've ever had, tomorrow I get to be better than I was today. And this little thing. Oh, heck this, yeah. This memento mori, another. Stoic saying, "You could leave life right now." That is that's motivation. Yeah, that I feel really, I feel really fortunate because every night 
as a songwriter, I get to talk about my deepest, darkest, most fucked up secrets, like all the wrong I've done in life. Not many of my most popular songs are about like unicorns and rainbows and baby kittens. Yep. They're about the mistakes that I have made. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people, those mistakes, they don't know how to talk about them. They don't have an outlet to, to push them out, to normalize them, to almost confess them on a daily basis. And I'm really lucky because I'm able to take the most fucked up things that I've experienced in life, put them in the songs, and then literally tell strangers about them every single night. It's the most cathartic thing ever. And I, I'm not, and not everybody gets to be a songwriter. Not everybody gets to do that every night. But like, that is such a help for me. And so maybe like, you know, I tell people, I'm like, even if you don't write songs, like, write down the fucked up parts of yourself and talk to your spouse about them. Talk mm-hmm. to your best friends about them. How did you get to that point? I think that's important to be able to be raw and open and vulnerable to start speaking that. When I learned that people weren't going to judge me for it, but embrace me for it. When I learned that it wasn't going to ruin my career talking about things that needed to be talked about. Because like in country music, from an early age, we're taught that successful country music comes from cold beer, pretty girl, dirt road, pickup trucks. Green tractors. Green tractors. (laughs) It's like redneck Mad Lib. It's like like really easy. Like how can we dumb this down to the common denominator to where – 17 year old high school girls and 40 year old blue collar hardworking men are still going to love the song. That's what country music, top 40 country music has been distilled into is how can we reach every demographic with one song? And it's easy. Talk about the cool things about being rural. Talk about Friday nights, dirt road, drinking with friends, good times. But nobody wants to talk about the fucked up things that you can't talk about at the Thanksgiving table. That's where I come in. That's where all of my favorite writers come in. I love talking about the stuff that like your mother would tell you to be quiet about at the dinner table, the dark shadows of the Southern experience. I love shining a flashlight into the corner and being like, Ooh, what's that disgusting thing over there? Let's talk about it for 30 minutes. (laughs) And I think that, and that's the kind of stuff that like we know going into it, like especially musicians like us, we know that that stuff's never going to get played on the radio because it doesn't reach a large swath of the American population. Yeah. But if you make, uh, I love this quote, if you make something everybody likes, you're going to make something nobody loves. That's amazing. There's no fair weather American Aquarium fan. There's yeah. nobody who's like, eh, they're okay. Yeah. They're always like, I don't get it. Yeah. Or Fuck yeah. I've seen them in seven states. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, it's like, there's nobody who's just like, ah, eh, they're okay. Yeah. Like, and I'm okay being that instead of everybody being like, oh, they're, they're, I, I hear their song on the radio Six times a day, so I guess they're good, you know. Yeah. I love it, and and I know Morgan Wade just went out with you guys early this last year. Last right? summer, last summer she was. Was she, that last summer? Was Holy shit! Summer twenty one. That's so crazy, man. I felt like it was just. A now few she's like ago. a superstar. Yeah, she's she's always going to be Morgan to me. Morgan Morgan's been opening up for us for like the last decade, and it, she used to open for us up, up around Roanoke, Virginia, where she's from. It's so good seeing her blossom. And again, I'm not saying that this is the only way to become successful, but sobriety, running, focusing in on who you are, and learning to embrace the bad shit that you've done and, and trying to truth. be a better person yeah. because of it. Like so many people think that if they write about how fucked up they are, they're going to be judged for it. And you might be judged for it. Like I still, there's some, you know, some people on the internet that like to take low blows at me for who I used to be. And that's fine. That's how you're going to, that's how you're dealing with something internal. I get it. Exactly. Like, If you have to take a blow at me to feel better about yourself today, do it. But eventually you're going to have to focus on what your real problem is. But Morgan's the same way. Morgan Morgan had some darkness, and Morgan overcame it, and I fucking love her. She writes a great song. She's got a great voice. She's got a great attitude, and I love – she's cut from the same cloth that me and a lot of my favorite people are cut from is, I don't give a fuck what you think about me. Like, I'm going to do what makes me happy, and if you don't like it, there's always tomorrow. Maybe I'll do something cool tomorrow that you like. But today, <laughs> fuck you. And I, and I love that. Yeah. I wish her nothing but the most success. She's coming and she's playing our, we do a big festival in Raleigh every year and she's coming and playing it this year. Right on. And she's just, she's just such a sweetheart. I love her so much. So go back to, you mentioned Muscle Shoals and Jason Isbell earlier. What was that like being in studio with that guy? So we made that record in 2011. So a lot of times when I talk about making a record with Jason Isbell, people think I'm talking about international folk hero, Jason Isbell. He wasn't Jason Isbell then. 
he was just the guy that left the drive by truckers. He was just like a songwriter, songwriter. He was probably playing in front of a couple hundred people every night. He was still a struggling musician. He was still drinking. I was still drinking. We were at very different times than we are currently. But it was still amazing because he was like one of my favorite songwriters of all time. So we made this record in Muscle Shoals, and he kind of saved our band. Our band was kind of on the brink of breaking up because at that point, we'd only been together for seven years, six years. We weren't making any progress. This is pre-coming to Texas, pre-booking agent. And he made that record for us. He produced that record kind of out of the kind of – it wasn't for the money. We didn't pay him hardly anything. But he did it because he believed in our band. Hmm. And he told us that we'd regret it if we didn't make that record. How did Joe make that connection? Me and him had just been friends since he left the truckers. I used to go see him when they were playing with the truckers. And then after he left the truckers and went solo, when he'd come through North Carolina, I was kind of the opening. I I would open for him. And then we realized that we both love brown liquor and shooting pool. (laughs) And that's what we did. We drank a bunch of liquor and we shot pool every time we hung out. Hell of a pool player. And we made a record that came out in August of 2012 and then the following february he got married got sober you know and southeastern came out lit the rocket ship and yep. launched him into orbit and now he's a superstar and and i'm lucky to call him a friend i'd be lying if i said that a lot of my sobriety wasn't modeled after his you know it, it's way easier to make life changes when one of your friends make a life change and all you see is positive Right. That's what I was about to ask is, did you look at that and say, oh, shit, I can still do this? Well, I looked at, oh, well, I looked at it, to be completely honest, I looked at it and said, if, if Jason can do it, I can do it. Because we both had problems. We both had heavy problems. And watching somebody that you would always be like, well, that guy's got a bigger problem than me. Watching him completely get that shit reined in, I was like, if Jason can do it, I have zero excuse. I can totally do this. Mm-hmm. And he was super kind. He answered a bunch of text messages early on. He answered a bunch of questions I had. And to this day, he's still a friend and one of my favorite people. So we were very lucky because we were at a very different point in our career, and so was he when we made that record. And it's just funny to look forward. That was 10 years ago. That record came out in 2012, so that's been 10 years, just to see the growth that both of us have made, not just as musicians, but as people, as husbands, as dads, as human beings. Like if you'd have wrote – an article about us 10 years ago about the, the men that we were, it had been negative. And I think that if anybody wrote articles about the men that we are today, totally opposite. I'm so thankful for that decade of growth because I've learned so much about me, about people in that 10 years. It's massive. So not only do I have Jason Isbell to thank for the, my career not ending prematurely, I also have him to thank for being a pretty solid role model in sobriety. That's awesome. I want to use this as a segue into your writing process. Did you think when you, whenever you got sober that you would not be able to be able to write songs? Of anymore? course. I think everybody's scared of that. We're taught so long that the only way you can be a good writer is to be tortured and to be under the influence of something else. And because that's where the magic comes from is the drugs. And it's like, you know, it's not you, the person, the brain. It's the, the things you're under the influence of. And once you learn that that is a total crock of bullshit, you're free. Once you write that first song that's better than anything else you wrote hammered, you're like, oh, fuck. That was was totally wrong. Like, this song rules. Do you remember that song for you? So the last last record I wrote drinking was Wolves. Wrote Wolves in... Probably early 2014. I didn't get sober until August 31st of 2014. Right here in Fort Worth, Texas. Was the last drink I had. And so Wolves was the last record I wrote drinking. So the first band record that I would have written sober would have been Things Change. So there's songs like When We Were Younger Men, One Day at a Time, The World Is On Fire. Some of the biggest songs we have. Sober. Some of the, like One Day at a Time, a song about getting sober, is one of the best songwriting songs I've ever written. Completely sober. About sobriety. Once you write songs like that, once you write songs that you put in your top five all time of your own music, that's when you can put that myth to rest. That it yeah. came from the booze or it came from the, the uppers or it came from the girls. Like It didn't come <laughs> from anything. It came from a dude sitting down and being honest with himself. Yeah. And I joke with people, I'm like, that clarity is what made me a better writer. That clarity is what made me your favorite songwriter. 
if I'm your favorite songwriter. It's it's sitting down and addressing really hard topics and not trying to candy coat them, not trying to hide behind a metaphor, not doing anything, not writing abstract about something to where it's up for the interpretation of the listener, <laughs> writing just deadhead, looking at the eye, giving it a name, calling it out, dragging it into the light, no matter how ugly it is, no matter how, no matter how ugly that monster in the corner is just dragging it in the light. Man, look, guys, it's not scary anymore. We're talking about it. That's what songwriting is for me now. And it's about finding these things that I hate about myself, about society, about people, and dragging that shit out into the light and being like, the more we talk about this, the less scary it is, the less we have to be afraid of. And that was a huge revelation. So people are like, well, did you worry about it? Yes, I worried about getting sober and how it affect my songwriting. But in turn, it made me such it made me way more observational. I paid way more. I liken it to, like, like, imagine getting really drunk and going and seeing a movie. And after the movie, somebody asking you really detailed questions about the movie. You might remember some of them, but for the most part, it'd be blurry. Mm-hmm. Then imagine going and seeing a movie completely sober. You can recall the funny lines. You can recall the serious stuff. You can probably recall what the person was wearing in this really iconic scene. Songwriting is the same way. Every song I've ever written is based on an observation. That's my job as a songwriter is to observe, process, said observation, and then communicate that observation in a three-minute song that gives you the full picture in a very small amount of time. So, of course, when I'm sober, my observation, instead of saying, like, oh, the sky was blue, the grass is green, the girl was pretty, it was the sky was this color blue, and the, and the grass was this kind of green that I haven't seen since this, and that girl had this color hair, she was wearing this color top, she had this kind of necklace on. It's those kind of details mm-hmm. that you miss when you're right, when you're trying to make that observation hammered or under the influence. You're missing those details, the details that could make or break a song. But when you're sober, you're able to retell the whole picture perfectly, and that's what sobriety is. That's all sobriety is, is especially when you have sobriety and you're talking about art. Is I'm better at retelling the story that I'm basing the song off of because it was pure. The input was pure. It wasn't tainted by anything else. I'm not making up a memory. I know for a fact these are the things that happened. And that just makes song, that makes a song stronger, makes it more detailed. It makes it more, holy shit, that dude's not making that up. That dude saw that kind of thing. I'm curious to know what, how do you do it? So any songwriter, most every songwriter I've sat down with, say if they sit down with a blank sheet of paper and a pen, it scares the shit out of them. Yeah. They just constantly have their antenna up and they're observing and they're they have the ability to put that into a, I'm lucky. I I am a songwriter in the age of technology. So I constantly have a microphone, a notepad, text message. Everything I have is. So when the ideas come through, you're writing them. So the ideas come. I've learned ideas are like rainstorms. If you get caught out in a rainstorm, it's a lot harder to catch rain. But when you learn to look up at the sky and know when the rainstorm's coming, it's easier to put a shit ton of buckets out. (laughs) When you first start writing and that first line hits you, if you don't write it down, you forget it. The longer you do this, you know when that, not to get super spiritual on people, but not a super religious person. But when it comes to songwriting, that's the closest I get to like a religious experience. Songwriting is not just me. Songwriting is the universe giving me a gift somehow. And imagine it like a giant, there's two separate planes. Songwriting exists on another plane. It's otherworldly. These are gifts from somewhere else that I get to be the conduit for. Mm-hmm. I want to be very clear about that. Like, this is not some genius of me. I've just learned how to receive it better than other people. Everybody could be a songwriter. Everybody gets these moments where you're driving down the road and you have a great idea or a great one-liner or a great idea for an invention, and then you don't write it down. Mm-hmm. And then you forget about it because the universe was like, they, didn't, they weren't ready to take that. So how many times have you had this idea for a song or an invention, six months later you look up and you see an infomercial for it, or you hear that line on the radio? The universe just gave it to somebody else. You weren't there to receive it when you were supposed to receive it. They gave it to somebody else. So songwriting for me is very much being able to reach into another plane, whether it's five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and and, and pull something out of that plane and bring it back to this plane. Is it a routine? Like, kind of like you doing it in the morning in the evenings i do mornings pen and paper M- mornings i, I sit at, at my computer with like a just a an, a word document open mm-hmm. with my guitar in my hand and i've got a sheet full of one-liners and ideas and i just go through them and i reread them every morning until something clicks and then maybe that one line leads to a rhyming line and then you got a couplet once you got a couplet all you need is one more couplet and that's called a verse <laughs> 
And so you sit there and, you, and you're, you're constructing, but it's just learning to look up, see clouds in the sky and say, well, I know what's getting ready to happen. I'm getting ready to catch something and setting up as many fucking buckets as you can to catch whatever you can. Mm-hmm. So that's why like my word document, a lot of times it's just rambling. It's just me catching every piece of rainwater. And then you go through and you're like, well, this shit's drinkable. Like, this shit's totally, this is, this is good. And that's all the craft is, is just learning how to receive as much of the gift as you can from, let's call it the muse. I think most people would understand that the being the muse is what we call that other plane. Mm-hmm. I don't like to give it that much power. <laughs> I don't like to personify it too much. <laughs> but when the muse gives you something, being ready to accept it and also knowing what to do with it. Yeah. Because like the muse can give the same idea to somebody else and they, have, they don't have the tools. They don't have the time. They don't have the craftsmanship. They don't. They haven't been doing this long enough to know what to do with it. Right. Like the muse gave me ideas long ago, and I tried. But I look at some of my old songs. I'm like, man, if the muse gave me that now, I could do so much better with it. It's like handing a kid some two by fours and some nails and saying, "Build a house." Right. And then turning around and handing a 30 year contractor the same materials and said, "Build me a house." You might get a structure out of both of them. You're gonna get a livable fucking functioning house out of the guy that's been doing it for a long time. That's all songwriting is. It's a craft. I am a cabinet maker. I am a house builder. I just do it with words. And the longer you do it, the better you get. I love it. Well, man, I'll ask you a few few quick questions here. Killer. And then we'll wrap it out. What's the song you're most proud of that you've written? Loaded question. They're all my kids. I like them all. Uh, you know, that's like walking up to a lady in the supermarket, you know, six kids and be like, hey, lady, <laughs> which one is your favorite? I like them all. One Day at a Time is a strong one for me. The first year I wrote about my mom on the new record is a strong one for me. Chicka Macomico is a strong one for me. Well, the World's on Fire is a strong one for me. Burn, Flicker, Die, Casualties, Lonely Ain't Easy. Those are all songs I sing every night. And I sing them every night because they mean something to me still. And they still live with me. Some songs are my favorite for different reasons. Some songs are my favorite because, hell, the luckier you get has made me the most money. So it pays my bills the most. So I like that song a lot. <laughs> Uh, Losing Side of 25 has, has paid my cell phone bill since I wrote the damn thing. So I like Losing Side of 25 a lot. All of them have different meaning. All of them have different. My love affair with them is different for different reasons. I don't put a song out unless I believe in it. So I'd say anything I put out in the last 10 years, I can still stand behind it pretty good. What's a song that you wish you wrote? Man, anything John Prine ever touched. Anything off that first Prine record, that first Guy Clark record. I love... Lucero is one of my favorite bands of all time. So like Tennessee, that much further west. Those records got me through a lot of shit. Which Guy Clark record? The old number one? Oh, oh number one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that record. There's not many. Like, Prine and Guy Clark are the two people I list debut records that are flawless. Yeah. It's not fair that they were that. It was that early in their journey, and they were writing that perfect a record. The, the unicorn shit. Like, you don't, people yeah. can't do that. You shouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> you shouldn't have a whole record that's your debut that's perfect. Yeah. That's not fair. And if you do, you should never be allowed any success for the rest of your life. <laughs> and those guys only continue to put out amazing material. Yeah. Like, if you write a really great first record, fuck you. I hope you fail the rest of your life. <laughs> but, like, John Prine and Guy Clark made entire careers out of it. You yeah. know? And it's, it's, you know, I am constantly trying to write a song as good as a John Prine song. And, and I think the word is timeless. I'm trying to write a timeless song. Right. I'm trying to write a song that kids, parents are going to show their kids, they're going to show their grandkids. Like the day that I can write songs and three generations of families are showing up singing them, I did my, I did it. That's a good song. I did good on that one. So you said you like to read. Is there a book that you gift most to other people or maybe that has impacted you the most? All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy is one of my favorite books I've ever written. I love S.A. Cosby's new stuff is amazing. David Joy is one of my favorite North Carolina writers. I just finished the two new Cormac McCarthy books that came out this year. They're really great. Larry Brown, phenomenal. Big Bad Love is one of my favorite pieces of American literature. I'd say if I gift anybody something, it's usually Cormac McCarthy. I think he's one of the best modern writers that we have. I don't think any, I don't think anybody's touching him as far as dialogue goes, as mm-hmm. far as character analysis goes. I think he's just as good. Like, I'll get some blowback from this. He's just as good as Faulkner was. He's a Hemingway. He's a really – he's like a – there's no bullshit. He writes mm-hmm. straight ahead. I love his dialogue. I love what he what he has to say. There's a reason that all of his like screen adaptations, nobody has to change any of the dialogue. It's all mm-hmm. dialogue straight from the book because it's that powerful. Like if you watch No Country for Old Men or The yeah. Road, they'll tell you they're like, no, we just took passages from the book 
We mm-hmm. didn't need to add anything. We didn't need to make up anything. The story was so perfect. So yeah, I say Cormac is who I who I model everything after. But Southern literature in general always intrigues me. Right on. Two more questions for you. Yeah. What's the next tattoo? Ugh, I've gotten to the point where I don't even think about them anymore. <laughs> me and my, I think me and my wife, we have like six or seven matching tattoos of stuff that we do together. She has an amorphity tattoo as well. We're big national park nerds. We've knocked off forty three of the sixty one national parks, and we just went to Hawaii for her birthday back in October. So I think we have, that was our 49th state together. Sweet. We've, the only state we haven't been to together is Alaska, and we're going to check that off hopefully soon. But uh, we've done all the states, and we always get a tattoo of, like, some of the fun ones, and we got to get a little Hawaii tattoo. That's and, uh, awesome. So whenever time aligns, I think that'll probably be the next one is a little, the little hula girl you put on your car, a little moving hula girl. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to get. I remember we're, we're both running out of space, but eventually yeah. uh, I'll, I'll get that added to the collection. That's awesome. All righty, my friend, last question. If you can have a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to get a message out to millions of people, what do you put on that billboard? Trust yourself. Bet on yourself every day. Like when, you're, when you're betting on yourself every day, like I don't think you can lose. I truly don't think you can lose. Bet on you. That's what it would be. Bet on you. Bet on you. I love it. BJ Barham, I appreciate you stopping by, my friend. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Time is our most valuable asset, so I appreciate you sharing it with me and listeners. And let folks know where they can find you. And what shows you guys may have coming up in January? AmericanAquarium.com for tour dates, online store. If you're into the social media, we're on Instagram at American Aquarium, Facebook American Aquarium, Twitter US Aquarium. And I run all the social media. So if you love it or hate it, you're talking directly to the guy. <laughs> and I answer all the questions. So if you, if you have any questions, you want to talk sobriety, you want to talk about lifestyle changes, and you don't have anybody in that inner circle or that friend group that you trust to talk to or want to talk to or will listen to you, just know that my the line's always open. I'm always willing to talk about being a better human being and changing who you were yesterday uh, tomorrow. I love it.